Today's video is sponsored by Love and Pies. Use my link below to download and join over 350,000 fans playing every day. Hey y'all, it's me, Bustania, and welcome back to Hot or Rot. And today we'll be reviewing episode 11 of RuPaul's Drag Race season 16. Our queens were split into groups and challenged to tell jokes via the medium of drag awareness seminars. And the runway category was flashback to DragCon 1980. So we'll be going queen by queen to break all that down, plus taking a look at plain addressing some accusations of insincerity on Twitter this week, plus going through the drama and fallout of a mandatory meetings feature on one of the drag seminars where she was referred to as a Halloween baby queen. And first it was we've got Plain Jane and Q who are doing a seminar on Do You Know Your Drag Herstory? And these two, more than any other group tonight, were super in sync with each other and the topic at hand. They start off by introducing themselves as Dr. Q and Dr. Plain Jane, MD, of course, and give us some really stupid but crowd-pleasing jokes like, take a look at these slides and these historic clips, which were just pictures of play slides and hair clips and the like on a PowerPoint presentation. They then go back and forth introducing us to some famous people of herstory who we may not have known were drag queens like old Honest Abe and Benjamin Franklin, aka Abraham Stinkin and BJ Bottoms. <laughs> And they end with a groundbreaking revelation that the Big Bang was actually the Big Tuck. These two are able to bounce off of each other, I think we're generally speaking funny enough for this type of challenge. And we even see this strange chemistry between their presentation characters develop as the skit goes on, where it ends with a surprise kiss. The only criticism I really had for their presentation was both queens felt like they were very much at the same level, and ultimately playing the same character. Some peaks and valleys or contrast in their character archetypes could have helped, I think, add a little more humor into the situation. But on the other hand, I think their tight synchronicity is what made their presentation feel so cohesive and good. So I give these two both <laughs> As for playing over on the runway this week, she gives us a super gorgeous pink and green, purpley blue neon swirl pattern of colors power suit with lots of different black fabric panels sewn throughout this look to add contrast and dimension. I love the way this jacket has those giant shoulders and the peplum around the waist. And let's be honest, Miss Plain Jane did a pretty good job of making making capri pants look sickening on the runway. I think a bigger concept than sickening 80s power suit could have helped sell a more interesting fantasy, but I loved the look as is. And I'm really enjoying seeing Plain expand the diversity of silhouettes that she has shown us in her runway catalog this season so far. This look is hot. And before we take a look at Q's look, I think it's important to highlight the conversation she was having in the workroom this week with her scene partner, Plain Jane. She was very bravely so open and honest about her HIV diagnosis, what that means for her and how she's handled all of this with her loving husband who we also saw pop in during Untucked with a really beautiful message. And I want to absolutely commend Q for sharing her story and truly being brave enough to talk about this stigmatized topic on national TV that has an international impact. However, it seems not everyone watching the sweet moment between Q and Plane interpreted Plane's response in a sincere way. A user on the platform X, formerly known as Twitter, screen capped this moment where Q says, I've been HIV positive for two years, and Plain responds, Mama, kudos for saying that, for spilling. And they wrote, Plain's response here is absolutely sending me. So unserious. And let me just say, if you hadn't watched the episode, I'm sure that reading this caption as her initial response to what Q is saying might read a little insincere, but having watched the episode, I can say that they're truly, from my perspective, was nothing but sincerity in the tone of her voice and how she handled this conversation with Q. And indeed, Plain took to defending herself online in response to this post, writing, I don't know. I meant it sincerely. Very proud of Q for sharing her status publicly on national television. That isn't to say that I'm not severely socially impaired, though, but I think we've all clocked that by now. Anyways, on to Q's runway, which is absolutely breathtakingly gorgeous and such, I think, a beautiful way to bring awareness to something like the HIV awareness ribbon that's literally a part of her suit jacket. The top part comes around her neck as a lapel and dramatic collar with the two ribbon pieces eventually trailing behind her in a train. And then the pattern of this power suit she's wearing is actually very much inspired by Keith Haring's art from the 80s. But instead of copying the signature bold primary colors used in his art, the pattern of this suit is all muted gray. I want that red ribbon to really tell the story of what's happening in this look. This look is so gorgeous and I love how she made it truly so 80s with with those huge shoulder pads and fishnet stockings. I absolutely love seeing drag that is living at the intersection of history, awareness, and fashion. Q did that. This look is hot. But do you like games? Hot tea, juicy drama, and mystery all wrapped up into one 
titillating experience? Which I guess is rhetorical since you're watching one of my videos. So go ahead and click the link in the description of my video to start downloading Love and Pies, one of my favorite games and the sponsor of today's video. Love and Pies is like a strategic matching game crossed with a telenovela, with the goal of trying to rebuild our cafe, which was tragically destroyed in a fire, while trying to solve the mystery of who did it along the way. To rebuild, we've got to earn some coins from our customers by baking them some tasty treats in our kitchen. We can see what treats our customers are asking for up top and then match ingredients in the square below to complete their orders. And my cafe is still a work in progress, but I've got some cute little pink flamingos out front for the customers to enjoy. And I was actually in the process of painting my cafe pink when this shady lady named Edwina showed up. Now let's just say after she bragged about stealing all my customers and flaunting the success of her mega cafe while simultaneously suggesting that my very own mother burnt down my cafe, I don't trust her anymore. Love and Pies is a lot of fun. And one of the reasons I love playing is because the creators of the game put so much work into including a wide, diverse cast of characters into the game. And I love how they send out special gifts to players on days like International Women's Day or the start of Ramadan. And you can start playing Love and Pies by clicking the link in the description of my video. Love and Pies is free to download and available on mobile devices. Thanks Love and Pies for sponsoring today's video. And next up we've got Dawn and Maya Amon LePage presenting on the topic of drag in the workplace. And Dawn starts her duo's presentation with a little joke about adult beverages and maybe being at the wrong gig, which sets the general idea for their presentation being about surviving a drag queen's presence next to you in the office and how to interact with them if they're there. And generally speaking, Dawn of these two was the more composed and on track throughout the presentation, but she does include throughout the bit these jokes about plain Jane, where she's featured in a slide as one of the queens returning to the corporate world and then also has her face on the can of bear spray. The context of plain Jane being the butt of the joke throughout throughout their presentation, being that she and Dawn had a little bit of a falling out at the beginning of this episode. Dawn basically said Plain's look was boring, and Plain came back at Dawn calling her a creature from the Black Lagoon that needs to go back, and saying she was wearing rags from a child's bedroom, and saying that she was all concept and no gorgeous, and <laughs> they went in on each other, basically. And while that explains why Dawn and Maya put plain into their presentation as a joke, I don't think it was ultimately successful because that was more of an inside joke with the audience of Drag Race rather than the live audience that was sitting there and responding to their set. That is all to say, I think Dawn did an okay job in this presentation, but the humor was kind of hit and miss even for me, someone who was clued in on why I should be laughing. And I am giving her a safe three flame hot here, mostly because she was able to deal with her scene partner Maya, who was really having trouble staying on track. She basically spits out some word salad in the middle of the presentation when she's trying to teach us about helpful phrases that we can use with the drag queens in our office and is out of sync with her partner Dawn when they're trying to say things like workplace and instead of place, she says room. And this chaotic character who rushed in and dropped her cue cards and generally felt a little flustered on stage could have been funny if there were any funny jokes alongside all of this messiness in their presentation, but there really wasn't. So I give Maya's portion of what happened in this challenge a <laughs> And over the runway, Dawn says she's serving as 80s rocker punk bitch with some chappy pants being suspended by a coat. Dawn's knowledge of fluid dynamics jumping out yet again. But this time I would argue not so successfully. This outfit for me lacks a central point of focus. It reads more as a random collection of fishnets, straps, stripes, patterns, fabrics, and things. And even Michelle Visage, who I would say is very much an 80s fanatic, and aware of that decade's style, didn't recognize Dawn's look as being 80s. But RuPaul actually seemed to enjoy this look a lot, acknowledging its punky roots and even compares it to a band called Zig Zig Sputnik, which after looking that band up, I can definitely understand that reference point. And generally, I do like the edgier aesthetic and way she approached this look. And I think it'd be really fun for an 80s night in a club or even a performance number on stage, but on the Drag Race runway, it just doesn't feel elevated enough for me. So I would give this look a rock. Maya Amon LePage on the other hand though, she said I'm gonna make sure that I hit this runway brief correctly and says that to get inspiration for this look, she literally Googled DragCon in the 80s and then recreated what she found. And someone on Reddit actually found what was apparently the reference she used and it's literally AI generated art, which is such a crazy train of thought to me because I don't think I would ever think to Google DragCon in the 80s, much less expect there to be a literal 
literal AI generated result of a look that you could actually use. That's that's so wild. But in this look, we see that inherent issue that I've always noticed with AI art in that it feels a little soulless. Because I'd argue this look is pretty. I enjoy the flower ruffles on the shoulder and the mint green color used to construct the catsuit portion of this. The cape of it is great. It just feels kind of unoriginal and I think is missing a more interesting concept than just being 80s inspired drag. But overall, for me, this is a safe hot. She does look good and she hit the brief. <laughs> AI really has come for everybody's jobs out here, even the drag clothing designers, Momo, and maybe even my videos. How would you know if I'm not an AI robot right now? And finally, we've got Cynthia Cristal, Nymphia Wind, and Morphine presenting, are you a drag queen? You might be surprised, who I'm gonna go through individually instead of as a group because they gave such wildly different performances. And starting with Safira, we immediately see upon the open of their little presentation that she is a professional when it comes to holding a microphone speak into a crowd. After the previous group's flop, the audience was very much in need of a little warming back up. And so she gives a little toast and tells a joke about putting dynamite somewhere it shouldn't go. And she also did a bit of group audience interaction at the end of their presentation where she made everybody stand up out of their chair and say, bitch work. And playing into this audience is so smart because they really probably have been sitting in their chairs, mostly watching drag queens get PowerPoint presentations for, uh, I would guess, an hour or so. And Safira got them up and excited and on their feet. And throughout their presentation, she really is the glue that keeps them progressing slide to slide. And she does have a small slip up where she stumbles over some jokes about drag narcissism, but she does, I think, a pretty good job of not drawing attention to the mess up. And like she does with literally everything, handles the situation with grace. She gets a hot for me. And over on the runway, she hits us with a larger than life 80s prom fantasy and of course is in a really interesting silhouette in a gown that is fashionable, campy, and generally fun and original. I love the oversized buttons and lapel with all the contrast in the black and the white. Everything just looks so chic and stylish and perfectly 80s. Plus she just looks absolutely gorgeous. I don't know if there was something a little different she did with her makeup here, but it's amazing. She looks hot. And next up, Nymphia Wind, who this episode goes through her usual routine of freaking out, being anxious about everything, and then ultimately doing just fine. There was a bit of controversy though, I suppose, with how she handled the character choice she made in this presentation. The comedy of her jokes seems to be mostly relying on Asian stereotypes and a really thick accent. And it seems the judges didn't really know how to receive this, because on one hand, they were applauding her for choosing such a bold character and sticking to it. But on the other hand, they're saying they felt nervous to laugh at some of the hyperbolized stereotype things she was saying. And she, during the critiquing session, explains her character choice as wanting to bring the different sounds of the world to her drag and ultimately the drag race stage. And personally, I was entertained by what she did. She felt like such a breath of fresh air, I think, compared to the, we won't say stale, but businessy presentation format of this challenge. And I do think it was a little weird to hear them be so critical of the accent choice she made considering we didn't hear them express those same concerns when Plain did things like speak in her really over accentuated Russian accent. But let me know what you all thought about all that in the comments below. She gets a hot for me. And over on the runway, Nymphia absolutely kills it. This look is so sick. She's giving us a reference to some looks Grace Jones did in the 1986 film Vamp. It has these super gorgeous concentric metal wiring accessories in her hair, on her chest, and in her pelvis area. And of how she also paid homage to Keith Haring's art here with those bold white stripes and patterns throughout the purple pieces of this power suit. The interplay of all the different references that she nailed here, the silhouette she accomplished, and the colors she used to do it all with that vibrant red pink hair against the purple suit. So gorgeous. This is fashion. It's a beautiful reference. It's a beautiful homage to multiple things. And I love Nymphia wins, runways, this look is so hot. And finally, Miss Morphine, who in the workroom is struggling quite a bit, confessing that she's never been to or done a seminar. And her segment to me was, in a word, strange. She introduces herself by seemingly cutting off what Nymphia is saying in her bit, where she's going on with her, you might be a drag queen if this, if that, and Morphine says, now I think it's time for drag vocabulary. And this wasn't totally clear to me if that sharp cutoff was planned, or just something that happened, maybe because Morphine realized the 
time constraints were going on. But either way, there was some awkwardness there that lended some uncomfortable vibes to Morphine's segment of the presentation, which ultimately was probably the shortest segment out of any of the queens on the stage tonight. And in her piece, she attempts to teach us the difference between regular slang and drag slang, comparing things like, that's sick, bro, versus that's sickening, mama. Which I think was a great setup, and had she had more time and not choked and brought attention to the joking, she could have been funny. But she literally stumbles through a joke and goes, goes, oop, drag queen flopping. <laughs> which is kind of funny, but not for the right reasons. And she wasn't the only one to stumble through this live one take presentation, but she was the only one to really draw attention to it in a noticeable way. Plus there weren't a lot of jokes, so I'd give this a rock. And over on the runway, she doesn't do much to save her overall performance in the episode tonight. This is, as Michelle describes, a little bit deflated Dolly Parton. And I see maybe in a way where she could have been going for some 80s like Western references, almost like stuff Trixie might wear. But for me, did miss that 80s mark and almost felt more 90s looking a little Romy and Michelle meets something about Mary with the way that hair is like flipped and awkwardly sticking up in the front. But more so than missing the brief, this runway just looked a little sloppy for someone like Morphine who generally has her aesthetic so perfected and nailed down. The beads dangling off the skirt looked a little arts and craftsy and it just overall was slightly messy. So I'm going to give this look a... And the win this week is actually kind of a gag. It goes to Safira Cristal, who secures her third win in this competition, now ahead of Plain Jane, Q, and Nymphia, who each have two. And I say her win here was kind of a gag, mostly because of the way the episode set up the storytelling and showed the critiques. Q and Plain Jane seemed to get nothing but positivity from every single judge. And it was clear that judges and audience members seemed to be enjoying their set more than any other. And I think objectively, their chemistry was the best and coherent throughout the presentation was the cleanest. I will say aside from playing Jane in Q, Saphira was the strongest out of everyone when considered on an individual basis, but I can't really say it made a lot of sense to give her the win. It felt much more like one of those produced let's crack Q and plain Jane moments because we even see Q like when she doesn't win, looking just like Miss Jane did given the face crack of the century back on the stage in multiple shots. Like she is pissed. She is seething. And like rightly so, because the judges basically told her and Plain they were going to win, and then they didn't give them the win. And Plain did speak about this on X, writing, All the love to Mother Saf. She was sickening up on that stage, but I also want to pat myself and Q on the back for our performances. I clocks no flaws. We ate that tiff up. The bottom two this episode were not a surprise to me. We have Maya on the page and Morphine, who gave one of the gaggiest lip syncs of this season so far, and I did react to this lip sync as well as the best parts of this episode over on my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. And you can get access to all of my exclusive reaction videos by clicking the link in the description of my video and joining my Patreon today. See you there. But this lip sync was gag after gag. I loved the energy and fight these two brought to the lip sync. And this was a full circle moment because we did see them going head to head a couple of weeks ago saying, I would have won, no, I would have won. And that fire comes out in moments like when Morphine's opening the lip sync with a back bend and Maya walks over and covers her with her cape, which like side note could have been dangerous because she could have just like back bend and broke her back there, but she recovered and threw it off like the diva she is. With the other highlights being Morphine's extra long extended split, her throwing one of her chicken cutlets at Maya after the cape incident, and then also when they jumped into a split together. This truly was an amazing lip sync, they both killed it, but I think the win rightly so goes to Morphine, and she gets to stay in the competition. And she, concerning her performance in this, did post on X writing, not me trending, just want to go on the record saying how much I love Queen of Flips. For those that don't know, I also was a part of the Miami ballroom scene. I walked face, OTA, drags face, so last night's lip sync was all fun and love, so proud of you. And Maya responded to this writing, I love you so much, sister. But of course, I'd love to know what y'all thought about the outcome of everything down in the comments below. And now let's wrap up with the drama surrounding a mandatory meeting and then do hottest hots. So this drama stems from the presentation segment with Safira, Morphine, and Nymphia when they're discussing drag queens being born during Halloween. And their slideshow pops up with baby queen examples like a mandatory meeting. And next, you screen camp this moment, posting it to the platform, writing, this was so nasty, hashtag drag race. Which Amanda reposted, writing, now do y'all understand why I have a complex? 
LMFAO. To which someone replies, notice how everyone thinks you're busted, but you only fixated on plain. And Amanda writes back, I mean, I could elaborate and explain my feelings on this, but y'all will still find a way to say I shouldn't feel the way I do. So I will in fact be keeping it all to myself today. Be blessed. About 20 minutes later though, she did elaborate on her feelings in another post writing, people will really be in the replies of a tweet ending in LMFAO telling me to laugh it off like I'm laughing. I said LMFAO and you're obviously bothered and I'm allowed to be smiley face. How about we just agree that all the season 16 girlies in any cast for that matter are going to feel how we feel as we experience something we lived play out on TV. That's the gig. We watch, we have our feelings and then move on. And in another pair of posts later that day, Amanda wrote, I think what's frustrated me is I went to Drag Race really excited to showcase my art and on the first day I shut the bed with my makeup, which became all anyone could talk to me about on set and everything I have to offer feels overshadowed by makeup slash getting red all the time. Like, I get it. I know we signed up to be critiqued and talked about, but reducing me to crunchy makeup when I'm literally so talented, charismatic, creative, funny, smart, and now gorgeous, it just feels so short-sighted of people, I guess. And Malaysia Babe with all Fox of season 15 responded sweetly to Amanda writing, welcome to Drag Race. What you showcase doesn't define the type of queen you are. This is the opportunity now to show the world everything else you're capable of. If you let people know it bothers you, that's all they will ever use to get a reaction. Focus. And Bianca Del Rio also <laughs> responded to this post in a lovingly sister reply writing, okay. To which Amanda responds, gonna start painting like you, maybe then I'll win something. And now for Hottest Hot. In the challenge, I'm gonna give it to Plain Jane and on the runway, Q. And I also asked my patrons to vote on their Hottest Hot for the runway this week and they've chosen Nymphia Wend. And I wanna give one more thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Love and Pies. Download Love and Pies using my link below and solve the mystery of who burnt down your cafe while you decorate it to your liking and restore glory to your mother's name. And I wanna give an extra special shout out to Ashley Brun Guard, Child Free Mateau, Dorothy Hall, Felicia, Laura, Matthew Burns, Steven Topher, and Will and Tana, who are all supporting me at my Bussy Queen Collector tier at patreon.com slash Bussy Queen. Love ya. Bye.